Hi, I'm the Space Quest historian. Oh, look, we're already up to the fourth game in the King's Quest series. I really have to thank everyone who stepped in and helped me out on Patreon. It really is making a tremendous difference in my tiny little SQH family's life, and we're very grateful for your support. So if you haven't already, please go and have a look at patreon.com slash spacequesthistorian. But right now, it's time for Princess Rosella to shine. You remember Rosella, right? We were introduced to her at the end of the last game and got to know her for a grand total of 20 seconds before the game ended. Well, I'll bet you're wondering which of these two traumatized kids caught Daddy King's adventurous hat at the end of the last game, and the answer is... none of them. Because suddenly, mid-throw, King Graham collapses on the floor and starts wheezing. Under normal circumstances, you'd just assume he'd swallowed a hit of bong water and is going to be fine after coughing it back up, if it wasn't for the fact that he's clutching his heart and turning a lovely shade of purple. Yes, King Graham is having a heart attack, and already I'm thinking this is the best game in the series so far. Suits the old bastard well. I don't understand why his kids are so upset at this. Alexander's barely known him for more than half a minute tops, and the last time he saw Rosella, he was giving her up voluntarily to be eaten and or charbroiled, by a giant fire-breathing dragon. If anything, these kids should be cheering and brainstorming what to spend their bottomless inheritance on. And meanwhile, Valinus is standing over here, hopefully feeling like a right bit of a nitwit, because just five seconds before Graham planked, she was telling her kids how everything was finally going to be all right again. Talk about jinxing. I mean, irony is a bitch, isn't it? So, very uncharacteristically for a daughter who was just given a death sentence by her dad earlier this morning, Rosella now sits in the throne room weeping, when the magic mirror- I swear, this fucking thing- I'm gonna have to pause here for a moment. This may be premature to tell you, but I'm working on a theory here that this magic mirror is actually the true antagonist of the whole series. I mean, think about it. It has done nothing but dick people over since Graham hauled it out of that dragon's cave. In fact, I think that may be why it very conveniently clouded over when this three-headed a dragon came to town and started gobbling up virgins. The mirror's rightful owner was that dragon in the cave, and has been wanting to go back there ever since. So it keeps sending Graham and his dumb kids out on stupid suicidal adventures. It tried to get rid of Graham in King's Quest 2 by sending him to Kalima and, I guess, get eaten by Hagatha or Grandma Wolf or whatever. It goes on strike in King's Quest 3 when Alexandra gets kidnapped because it's in league with the dragon and hopes the dragon will take care of everything, which it almost does. And it's about to do some bad shit in this game too, you just wait and see. Well, bad for the Daventry family. I mean, it is stolen property. I, I know people have told me future versions of King's Quest 1 try to retcon these three magic items into being King Edward's properties that got stolen or something, but bullshit. Nothing in the original version of the game said any of this. Not the manual, not the in-game text, so screw that George Lucas bullshit. This mirror belonged to the dragon, Graham stole it, and the mirror's held a grudge ever since. That's my headcanon, at least. We'll see how right I am as the series progresses. Anyway, back to King's Quest 4. The mirror's latest scheme to fuck over the royal family of Daventry is to open up a subspace communications channel to the land of Tamir, specifically with a fairy called Genesta. She says there's a magic fruit in her land that'll cure anything, but it only grows once every 100 years. Already that should be a warning sign something is amiss, but we'll let it slide for now. She says she'll happily teleport us to Tamir so we can go and find it, but oh, wouldn't you know, you just have to sorta maybe kinda help us out a bit. I'll explain when you get here. Honestly, this already feels like the fairy tale equivalent of a Nigerian email scam, but we already know Rosella isn't the sharpest knife in the cutlery drawer, so of course she says sure thing, and zap, suddenly, we're on the shores of Tamir with no way of getting back. Janesta arrives and lays out the sitch. She wants us to get her talisman back from the hilariously named evil fairy Lolot, who even had the audacity to run away cackling after she took it. Oh my. Apparently without the talisman, she'll lose all her magic powers and die within 24 hours for some reason. I don't know, she seems pretty spry to me. Also, I have no idea why we're getting involved in what sounds like a high school bitch fight where the two queen bees are fighting over who's the most popular girl at school. Or if the talisman is so fucking precious, why Janesta keeps it around her neck neck in a flimsy necklace, but fact of the matter is, she only had enough magic power to bring us here, and to fly all the way over here to tell us this, and to fly all the way back, apparently, but not to send us home, unless we get her talisman back. Oh, and that magical fruit, yeah, it's, it's somewhere on the other side of the mountains in a swamp, I actually have no idea how to get there. Good luck, asswipe! Oh, hey, before I go, let me just disguise you as a peasant girl. Yeah, I also have just about enough magic left to do that, so you'll have no authority or status to throw around. And before you can ask her how exactly that's supposed to help us in any way, shape, or form, off she fucks. 
Look, I'm getting some seriously shady vibes off of this Janesta character already. I get the feeling we've been brought here under false pretenses, and we're just being super gullible and taking her word for everything. I mean, how do we know the talisman is even hers? How do we know this magical fruit even exists if she doesn't know how to get it? And if it does exist, how do we know someone else hasn't already nabbed it if it only grows once every 100 years? And why, if she cares so much about the land of Tamir and its well-being, does she live on her own private island off the coast of the mainland? I mean, I'm serious, you can just hop in the sea and swim over there. It's a lovely place, sure, but if you go up to a bedroom and try to coax anything meaningful out of her, her buzzing little insect minions here will just sternly insinuate that you can go to hell. That's it, we're not getting anything more out of her. Not even an explanation as to why she would think Rosella would even be qualified for this gig. She just had a feeling. Either she was just drunk dialing magic mirrors hoping to find any old sucker who could do her work for her, or, in my head canon, she and the magic mirror in Daventry are in on it. Cause her story just doesn't add up. Anyway, Rosella is dumb enough to actually buy all of this shit, so she decides to just waltz up to Lolot's castle and see what's what. She doesn't even make it two steps up the driveway before she's captured and immediately accused of being a spy, which she is, and thrown in the dungeon. At this point, if Rosella had two stones to bash together in that dopey fucking head of hers, she would be cursing Janesta's stupid name and her stupid disguise idea right to fucking hell, but no. She just stands there, presumably resigned to rotting in this fetishist's wet dream. But before she can get too comfortable with any of the delightful sex aids on display here, she's hauled back out of the dungeon and told that Lalotte's son, Edgar, this sniveling little twerp I didn't even notice was there the first time, has taken a liking to her, and if she goes and gets a unicorn for her, she'll let you off the hook. At no point during this entire scene does Rosella as much as utter a peep of protest. She just goes along with Janesta's harebrained idea of posing as a peasant girl, which, let's be clear here, would have left her to rot in a fucking dungeon had it not been for the power of teenage fairy boners. What kind of a fucking plan was this anyway? The flying henchmen drop Rosella off at the foot of the mountain, and at this point any normal sane person would have gone back and beaten one last teleportation spell out of Janesta, cause fuck everything that's going on here, but no, Rosella just decides to go and do what she was asked to do. I have no idea why. Is she under the assumption that the lot is just gonna give her the talisman when she's done? Cause that is a whole new and exciting level of gullibility right there. And of course it doesn't stop with the unicorn. After you're done with this unicorn shit, and trust me, I'm not, but we'll skip ahead for a brief moment here, there's two more things Lalotte wants you to go and get. A hen that lays golden eggs, which this obnoxious shit pipe has, and fucking Pandora's box, which is just lying around in a crypt at the local cemetery. I have so many why questions, I feel like my brain is going through a tumble dryer. Why does Lalotte want a hen and a unicorn? Is she opening a petting zoo? Why is there a catacomb here that actually has fucking Pandora's box in it? Why does she think Rosella will actually go and get these things for her? Why does Rosella actually go and get these things for her? Why doesn't Rosella entertain any alternative plans at all for getting the talisman back? And why, for the love of fuck, would anyone ever say the phrase, I am desirous of? Look, it's pretty clear we're not going to get anything remotely coherent out of this plot, so let's focus on the mechanics of actually getting this shit. And this is a great time to talk about the two things that will make you go absolutely insane while playing this game. The first one is RNG, as in stuff that happens randomly in the game world. You thought the eagle puzzle in King's Quest 3 was bad? Ha! <laughs> Wait till you see the shit they've got in store for us here. Everything! is RNG here. This unicorn we're supposed to find in our first quest appears randomly. You can walk around for ages and never see it, or you can get a lucky dice roll and see it straight away. Same goes for this worm in the ground, this guy playing the lute, this whale in the water, fucking Pan over here, and fucking Cupid. Cupid is taking a dip in this pool here and you have to steal his bow and arrow, so congratulations, love is dead and it's Rosella's fault, but good luck figuring that out because again, whether or not he appears here when you enter the screen is entirely random. It must have been fantastic good fun for players in 1988 with no access to hints or walkthroughs to spend ages and ages walking blindly across these screens only to have some events suddenly trigger that they've never seen before and then spend the rest of the day wondering what the hell they were supposed to do about it. Because if you aren't quick on the draw, this worm will fuck off back into the ground and if you don't scare Cupid off here while he's taking a dip, he'll just take his bow and arrow and piss off. 
None of these puzzles are telegraphed properly in the game. It's all a giant mess of trial and error, and the game takes every opportunity it can to viciously dick the player over. And they kick off strong, because the whole business with getting the unicorn here is by far the worst offender. This puzzle expects you to make so many leaps of logic, you'll swear you're training for the Moon Logic Olympics. You tame it by shooting one of Cupid's arrows at it. That doesn't make it fall in love with you, no, it just becomes your friend, so already we're messing up our mythology here, but whatever. You're then supposed to ride it back to Lalotte's castle, but you haven't got a way to do that. I guess we're not that good friends after all, eh, horsey? But luckily, there's a simple way to go about this. You just have to go clean these seven dwarfs' house so they'll leave behind this bag of diamonds that you give to this asshole fisherman who then gives you his fishing rod, which you then use to show the fisherman how shit he is at his job by catching a fish after numerous RNG fails, after which you toss yourself into the sea and hope you don't get caught by this RNG shark that's an instant death sentence, so you can get swallowed by this RNG whale and make it up to the top of its tongue without losing your footing or your goddamn mind, and tickle it with this peacock feather you better remember to pick up over on Genesta's Island, cause if you didn't and you get swallowed by the whale you're now dead princess walking, and then get spit out next to this island where you give the fish you caught to this pelican who coughs up a whistle that when blown summons a dolphin that'll take you back to shore. Fucking what? Oh, and we completely forgot the thing we actually came here for. Yeah, we need to get a bridle for the horsey. It's on this little island somewhere. Do you see it? No? Well, neither does Rosella. You can look ground all you want, and she'll just report that she sees sand, unless you're standing right here, in this very specific spot inside the little shipwreck. Then she sees a bridle in the sand. Go absolutely Fuck yourself, Rosella. Can a computer game make a person cry? Oh yeah, it can, but for all the wrong fucking reasons. Holy shit. And if the game hasn't already reduced you to a blubbering mess of frustrated tears, then how about a lovely spelunk through these caves? There's a giant super fast ogre roaming the screens who is almost impossible to avoid and will randomly spawn every time you enter a screen, and also you can't see shit because this lantern is just categorically the worst lantern of all time, and then if you somehow manage to clear your way through this gauntlet of RNG fist fucking, the game then throws an invisible insta-death sheer drop down a chasm at you, just in case you were somehow enjoying yourself too much. Next, the game throws the most insulting non-puzzle at you. You're supposed to make it across the swamp to get to a tiny island where the fruit that'll save Daddy Graham is. You do this by typing jump 15 times. What? Am I solving a puzzle here? Am I in any danger? Why is this even here? Is it just so it can dick me over at the final jump where I have to put this board down to make it across? Because that's real funny, dickhead. I would facepalm at this, but I'm afraid I'd smack myself so hard my wrist would go straight through my skull and out the other side. And yes, Roberta Williams still thinks snakes are poisonous. Give her time, I'm sure she'll- A poisonous snake! Ah, uh, fuck it. Anyway, the magic fruit is ours. We can go home now, right? No, we still have two more of the lots of name quests to do. Fine, we're off to kidnap a chicken. We hide in the ogre's closet, wait for him to fall asleep, then swipe the hen and scoot like the wind. We then give Lolot the hen like a good little girl, and we're now told to go get Pandora's box. By this point, even Rosella is starting to catch on to the faintest glimmer of a notion that Lolot might not be on the level here. In fact, she even wonders to herself if she really should be helping her this way, then immediately shrugs it off as if she has no other options. You have plenty of options, you dim-witted little bint. Just off the top of my head here, remember this axe we swiped from the ogre's house? Yeah, just lob the fucking thing at her face and we can all go home. Or, if that's too violent a solution for you, how about this? How about you wear this crown you got that turns you into a frog, sneak past everyone, hide somewhere in the castle until it gets dark, and then hop in and swipe the talisman? But no, the sensible thing to do, obviously, is to go get the villain a mythological box that she herself says contains the purest evil, and that with it she'll be unstoppable. Fucking hell. Around this point in the game, the in-game clock will have switched to nighttime. Yes, there is an in-game timer, but it's not as annoying as the one in King's Quest 3, in that it doesn't serve to magically teleport a screeching child abuser in your face every 30 minutes. Rather impressively for the time, the game actually has a day and night cycle, and they actually went to the trouble of redrawing every single outdoor screen for nighttime. Well, in the first version of the game at least. Uh, later down the line, Sierra felt the game was too expensive to duplicate, so in later versions, they reprogrammed the game to use the same screens for day and night, and just replaced the day sky with a night sky. Anyway, when night falls, all of a sudden, this turns into an episode of Ghost Hunters. For the next half hour or so, you'll be wandering in and out of this old house, looking at ghosts, then going out to desecrate their graves and bring them back whatever shit they think they've lost. Even though they were buried with these things, so I don't know what their problem is. And 
And if you think you do this two or three times, then good god, you're wrong. Try five times. Five ghosts, and the methodology never changes. It's always just look at the fucker, then go look at the tombstones and see which one might be the ghost you've just met, then dig it up and bring back whatever you find in the grave. Oh, and dodge these fucking zombies while you're at it, which you can't because Rosella takes for fucking ever to do her grave robbing, and you will get sideswiped by an undead long before she's done. Also, this shovel breaks after you've used it five times. No explanation, it just does. I guess it's to prevent you from just digging up every single grave in the whole cemetery, but what this also does is leave you with absolutely no margin for error. If you get a single one of these tombstones wrong, you can't finish the game. And they pulled the same shit back in King's Quest 2 with this bridge, which will only let you cross it the exact number of times you need to. So if you make one unnecessary trip across it, perhaps to refresh your memory of what ultra-vague and borderline pointless hintless door inscription had for you, then screw you, you're now unable to finish the game. There is a special place in hell reserved for adventure game designers who think this sort of shit is funny. Oh look, I got two zombies stuck here. <laughs> The best way to have these George Romero rejects fuck off and leave you alone is by going inside this not at all suspicious looking cave and getting a scarab off of this sorority party gone wrong. It's anyone's guess why they have a scarab that warts off the undead or why they're so willing to give it up when they live right next to a graveyard that's crawling with the undead, but whatever. Later, sisters. Anyway, even with the zombie be gone scarab, this is still fucking tedious. And by the end of this ghostly gauntlet, we're finally treated to... <laughs> Remember when I said there were two things in this game that would make you go absolutely bonkers? The first one was RNG. Here's the second one. Stairs. Now, I've played Sierra games. Hell, I worked on StairQuest, the fan tribute to Sierra staircases. I know how to navigate staircases, but this game... Oh, God. remember in King's Quest 3 when they tried to fix ladders and ended up making them worse? Yeah, in this game they did the same thing to stairs. Look at this. The first half of these stairs, your controls work about as you'd expect. But once you get up past this bend, all of a sudden, the controls invert. Once you round this corner, you'd expect to push down to make her come towards you, but no, you push up, which would normally move her away from you, but now instead, it suddenly moves her up the stairs. This takes some serious mental gymnastics to wrap your head around, and it gets much, much worse later in the game when you have no idea where the fuck you are on these stairs that are about two pixels wide and will gleefully throw you to your death at the slightest wrong move. This inverted controls bullshit is where I nearly lost it. If they wanted to fix stair climbing in these games, here's a fun and novel suggestion. How about just drawing stairs that aren't such a fucking bitch to climb? And while we're on the subject, the distance from which Rosella can drop and survive is total fucking bullshit as well. Look at this. Whoop. I'm fine. And here, same distance. <laughs> Dead. Eat my shit, game. Fine, we get inside the crypt and- Oh, hi there. Uh, bye. Yoink! Back to Lolot, who tells us that our reward, surprise, isn't whatever we thought it was. It's the honor of marrying her little sniveling weasel of a son. Again, Rosella has any number of powerful weapons at her disposal, including now a box that contains an unstoppable force of evil, but for some reason picks the option that involves her being trapped in this kid's wank-stained bedroom. He does somewhat redeem himself by surreptitiously giving you a key that apparently unlocks every door in the castle. Cool. It's not entirely clear why, though. His motivations, like anyone else's in this dumb game, are left entirely to the player to wonder about and are never explained. It's not clear if he hates his mom's guts, or if he's just so smitten with you that he hopes you'll repay the favor by letting him plumb your trench. My money's on the ladder, because if you fuck up this bit and stay until morning, he clearly has no problems going through the forced wedding ceremony with you, during which Rosella fakes a fainting spell like the mature adult that she is, and apparently later dies from embarrassment because no one's heard of divorce around these parts. Anyway, using this mask Key, we sneak into Lolod's bedroom, resist the urge to climb in and give her a snuggle, and now realize we don't actually have a good plan. The talisman we came for here is around her neck, but we can't just grab it because if you wake her up, she screams Viper, of all things, and instantly zaps you into dust. Now, I, I know Viper can also mean someone who's treacherous and deceitful, I'm just saying that's a weird fucking thing to be screaming when you wake up. I just pictured a lot and her idiot son going on vacation somewhere and ordering a wake-up service from the hotel reception, and then at 8.30 in the morning, the phone rings and she bolts up right in her bed, grabs the receiver and screams VIPER at the poor bastard at the front desk, and then zaps the phone into oblivion. Okay, so we need to incapacitate her in some way, and once again, because Rosella can't stand the sight of a little axe-induced decapitation, we have to find a peaceful option. 
Oh, I know. How about we shoot her point blank with an arrow? Yeah, that'll do. You shoot Lolot with Cupid's arrow, sending good vibrations and a special tingle through her, which then kills her because she was just that evil. And we get this bizarre fourth wall Wizard of Oz joke in here because deep down even the game knows this is just fucking stupid. And then Edgar shows up, doesn't even acknowledge his mom's corpse in the room, and just says you may now walk freely about the castle, then fucks off before his boner curves upright and pokes his eye out. And now it's just a victory lap through the countryside, down to the pier, into the drink we go, and a quick swim back to Janesta's island, only to be eaten by the fucking RNG shark halfway, because of course that thing is still around, why wouldn't it be? This game hates you, remember? The end. No, I'm kidding. If you make it there, Janesta suddenly perks right the fuck up and teleports herself and you onto the beach. She then teleports Edgar here as well, which seems like an invasion of privacy, but she doesn't give a shit, and then in a truly disgusting, awful moment, decides to reward his bravery by making him handsome. This is just so fucked up, I don't even know where to begin. I don't know if I'm more mad at the beauty standards and appearances are everything trope, or the underlying racist implications of turning him from a green-skinned fairy into a stereotypical white male human, or the fact that he immediately proposes marriage to Rosella despite only having known her for a combined total of seven minutes, which means he's just as shallow and awful as these other two idiots. Rosella shows that she does have a tiny morsel of common sense stuffed away somewhere in that hollow skull of hers, because she tells Edgar to pound sand, and now we can finally go home and shove this magic fruit down dad's throat. Now, I would be highly suspicious of this fruit right now since everything else Janesta's put us through has led us to be either captured to be presumably tortured, or boiled and eaten by these ogres, or eaten alive by their dog, or eaten alive by the shark, or eaten alive by zombies, or come to think of it, a lot of people really want to eat Rosella. Anyway, without so much as a cursory inquiry into the potential harmful side effects, Rosella is zapped back to Daventry and feeds Daddy the fruit. He perks right up and decides to keep his adventurous hat for himself, because fuck you kids, Daddy's on a brand new high and is off for more adventures. Let's not tell him this fruit only grows once every century, because this dizzying high is bound to wear off at some point, and I have a feeling this drugged out old bastard's in for some serious withdrawal symptoms. But here's the kicker. There's the alternate ending that's also the absolute clinching proof that Janesta is absolutely full of shit. If you make it all the way to the end without the fruit, and then give her the talisman, she just zaps you back to Daventry so you can watch Daddy bite it. It's well within her power to teleport you to the fruit, or even better, just zap it straight into your hand, but no, it's just thanks for the talisman, bitch. I got what I wanted, now fuck off back to where you came from. Janesta didn't give a rat's ass about you, she just wanted her jewelry back. Maybe at least now she has it back, she'll staple it to her fucking forehead or something so she won't lose it again. Oh, and this fruit, by the way, uh, you can eat it yourself. You can just fucking eat it yourself. I mean, you came all this way, Rosella. You braved countless mind-bogglingly meaningless, hopelessly obtuse obstacles with no plan and wearing the most unhelpful disguise of all time, only to eat it yourself. Why does the game even give me this option? And needless to say, if you do this, you're locked out of the good ending. The fruit doesn't come back, you can't regurgitate it back up and spoon feed the seeds to dad. That's it, you fucked yourself. If you haven't got a save game from before you did this, you may as well restart. It's these sort of whoopsie, unwinnable states that have given Sierra their reputation as being sadistic. There are people in BDSM dungeons right now being given the option between being flogged 30 times on their scrotums or playing King's Quest IV, and they're picking the nut thrashing. But I haven't even talked about the worst part of this game yet. Now, you'd think it was the RNG, and that is terrible. You'd think it was the stair climbing, which is also terrible. But there's one thing about this game that's more awful than anything else it can throw at you, and it can be summed up in just four simple words. You're not close enough. This game is picky as fuck about where you're standing in order to do anything. You can be inches away from this tombstone, and the game will tell you to move closer. You can be standing within breathing distance of this book on the shelf, and the game will cross its arms and tell you to scoot a foot and a half. You could be elbow deep inside this unicorn's asshole, but you're still not close enough to climb on top of it. You're never close enough. I've seen strategic tactical simulators that were less picky than this game. And it's not that this is a technological limitation, this game is very much capable of moving Rosella to a predetermined and hotspot when it wants to, this ladder in the attic for instance, they could have done this easily with any other object in the game, but no, they had to be dicks about it. And this is them being dicks about it, don't try to tell me otherwise. You think they weren't pissing themselves laughing at watching playtesters run up and down this fucking unicorn pen trying to free this whinnying little prick and being told repeatedly they were in the wrong spot? 
The whole game is full of this sort of shit. There's playful teasing, and then there's just straight up bullying. And this game is a bully. It delights in your misery, and it revels in your misfortunes. It teases you with the promise of a whimsical good time, but makes up the rules as it goes along, twisting them at its demented pleasure, and then laughs at you for not seeing it coming. This game doesn't just hate you, it despises you to the point where your suffering gives it pleasure. I honestly don't know how they could market this as lighthearted family entertainment and then throw dead babies, invisible chasms, random death sentences, inverted stairs, and this many Walking Dead scenarios at you. And I'm not talking about the zombies, I'm talking about scenarios where you can fuck yourself over to the point where completing the game becomes categorically impossible, but you have no idea you're stuck in an unwinnable state until you've exhausted every option or driven yourself mad. But it's not all bad. I gotta give props where props are due, and there are two things that spring to mind here. First of all, the music. It is fucking stellar. Sierra Tad William Goldstein, a composer best known for the score to the TV series Fame. like Glee but in the 80s and with a lot of disco in it for some reason. Look, the point is, Mr. Goldstein fucking knocked it out of the park. This is next level stuff. I mean, the music in the previous games wasn't terrible or anything, but it was a little all over the place. Here, have a listen to this and tell me where you think it goes. If you guessed anything other than the ghosts guarding Dracula's castle in King's Quest 2, you were wrong, and I wouldn't blame you for that. The music in King's Quest 4, however, is memorable, grandiose, every part of it fits like a glove, and it has everything you could want in a proper film score. It is by far the best thing about this game. The second thing is the animation. I mean, some of this stuff is just way beyond what you'd normally get in other games of this era. There are so many frames in this tiny little animation of Rosella ducking under the bridge, or this animation of Rosella climbing down this ladder. I mean, the sheer effort that went into this is undeniable. So honestly, on the presentation side, I can't fault the game. I mean, it looks and sounds really good, but is it fun to play? Sure, if your idea of fun is stapling your nutsack or labia to a car door and then telling the driver to take off at high speed. Anyway, time for the bonus round, and this one is VIPER! Sorry, <laughs> this one is a big one. I've already told you how they re-released the game later and cut corners on the nighttime screens. They didn't just do that. In fact, they went in and redrew quite a few of the backgrounds as well. I mean, here, check out the entrance to the witch's sorority. But that's not the wild thing, oh no, King's Quest IV was the first game Sierra released that used their new SCI engine that allowed for full high resolution 16 color graphics in 320x200, and it was mind blowing at the time. So mind blowing in fact that they feared they'd lose sales if they didn't offer a version that could run on less than mind blowing systems of the time. So they actually built and released a separate version that ran on their previous game engine, AGI. Yes, this game has the unique distinction of being available in both a high res and low res version in two different game engines. Now that is dedication. And the AGI version actually looks pretty decent. In some cases, I'd argue it even looks better than the SCI version. I mean, look at Alexander here, and then look at his goofy fucking sad face in the SCI version. Or this close up of Rosella talking to Janesta. I know, granted, Rosella looks like she just got into Graham's stash back at Daventry before she got here, but stone princess faces aside, I actually prefer the low resolution version here. The AGI version does have its share of unique features not found in the SCI version, such as a special look message for the trapped unicorn that tells us that they beat the shit out of it. The SCI version just says it looks sad. Oh, and the RNG is way, way worse in this version. I mean, for some reason, this guard in Lalat's castle doesn't wake up if you get too close to him. No, instead, it's a dice roll. You just have to save your game and reload if it decides you're gonna get caught instead of sneak by. I mean, come the fuck on. And yes, it has the easter egg where if you type beam me on the screen, you get teleported to a space station with all the Sierra programmers who worked on the game and you can talk to them. I think everyone knows about this. I mean, even I knew this and I've never played the game before doing this video. And same goes with this easter egg in the dungeon where if you type KQ rap, Rosella does a merry little jig while the programmers drop a sick diss track on Roberta Williams. But there's more fun to be had. The pathfinding in this AGI version is just as stellar as we've come to expect. This witch in the cave will never catch Rosella for as long as any of them live, and neither will the zombie behind the tombstone. But if you want a full-on head trip, check this out. 
This is King's Quest IV for the Apple IIGS. Now, it's curious in two respects. First, it's based on the AGI version, so it is the low resolution version, but it also seems to have more colors than the PC version. The 2GS does this weird thing where each scan line can have a separate color palette, so the 2GS actually has more colors in it than either of the IBM PC versions. It's also the only version of King's Quest IV that has digital sound effects like this lovely unicorn. <laughs> this lovely door squeak. And this crying baby in the haunted mansion. Which, admittedly, is a little overexcited, but that's because we turned the emulator speed up to unlimited, so it's not actually supposed to be like that. I just like playing these Apple II GS versions because they're such anomalies. For the most part, they were clearly the deluxe versions of Sierra's old AGI games because they had more colors and better sound than any of the other home computer versions, yes, including the Amiga. And by the time King's Quest IV rolled around, Sierra was in this special transition phase where the IBM PC was beginning to overtake the other contenders, even the Apple II GS, because you had Roland MT32 music with King's Quest that practically sounded like you had the London Philharmonic in your living room at the time. And a year later, you'd have Space Quest 3 that also included digital sound effects. Where am I? So for all intents and purposes, King's Quest 4 was the last great adventure game Sierra made for the Apple II GS. Well, except for Gold Rush, which came out a year later, but who's counting that one? Anyway, that's it for King's Quest 4. Once again, thank you to all the people who stepped up to help me on my Patreon. Please have a look at patreon.com slash spacequesthistorian if you want to know more. I've added some new tiers recently where you can have your own soundtrack reorchestrated or look over my shoulder as I'm writing these scripts for these videos. Uh, we've already hit the milestone for a King's Quest 5 video, so I'll see you for that one next time, un unless someone drops 50 bucks and I have to play whatever game they say I have to play. And remember to follow me on Twitch, where I live stream my playthrough of these games. And until next time, I'll see you around the Chrono Stream. Bye! Viper! Viper!